Hazel, Hazel Thompson, welcome to Facing the Canon. You are a photojournalist. What is a photojournalist? Um, I tell stories with pictures. So, so what's the difference between a photographer and a photojournalist? Um, as a photojournalist, it is, it's storytelling. So as a photographer, you may be capturing one image, but with, as a photojournalist, I'm creating a narrative. I'm telling the whole story in images. And you also write. So there's an, an element of writing, but it's, it's picture-led. OK, so when you were at school, growing up, um, is this what you wanted to do? I actually wanted to be a vet. <laughs> Did you? I'm animal-obsessed. Um, I wanted to be a vet when I was younger, but um, I was very creative and rubbish at maths and science. And um, I actually was a painter, and I was drawing... I constantly had a notepad on me from a very young age. And when I was about 13, 14, I was doing my GCSE artwork, and a teacher at school taught me how to use uh, just a SLR. It was an SLR then, not a DSLR. An SLR, which was a 1970s camera. And I started to take pictures for my preliminary studies, for my artwork, and I literally fell in love with the camera. It was like a love affair. So when you left school, you didn't go to university? No, which and, was a big... Oh, so how did your family <laughs> react? Well, I'm from um, a good middle-class family where your life is mapped out. You know, I, I went to a very good girls' school and, um, you know, from that you'll go to a good university and obviously I'll meet a nice hedge funder, be <laughs> yes. married by 24 and live in the suburbs. <laughs> Basically, I, this love, this passion for photography became very strong. And when I got into my A-levels, I was like, I, I got halfway through and I said, I want to study photography. And my school was like, well, you're already doing art, you're already doing drama. Yes. <laughs> um, you need to do some academics. And, um, and <laughs> I um, went, OK, then, as soon as I, I turned 18, I was older for my year, they said, no, you can't study photography. I, I went to the adult education college and I studied photography in the evenings with all these 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. It was wonderful. And a local photographer who was a teacher studied my A-level photography in a year well, I did my three and a, I think a three and a half other yes. subjects at school. And um, I passed my A-levels and I, I basically announced I want to be a photographer. Do you know that some of those teachers that discouraged you, do they know that you're a, an award-winning photojournalist? Um, I actually haven't, I haven't, I haven't stayed oh. in touch with those teachers. If it was me, teachers. I'd probably go and tell them. <laughs> <laughs> it's tempting. I think I remember getting an invite to do a careers day. Yes. And I was very honest and wrote back and said, you will know I will let, let, let I will be very honest that you discouraged me yes. from doing this career. But it is quite a while back. I remember that I had a wonderful um, theology teacher who really encouraged me. And... Um, yeah, I, I, I had a major life experience. When I was 17, I was in a road accident. And I, I really, that was a life-changing experience for me. And that's when I found my spirituality and found my faith. So that was a big part of kind of pushing me that direction yes, to becoming a photographer. your journey. Well, one of the early stories that you did was to go to America and uh, follow a group of bikers. Um, and um, you did that. You, you like rode on a bike for 2,000 miles to try and write a story. Tell us about that. Well, that was, um, people would think I'd make it up. I just wanted to ride on the back of a Harley. <laughs> um, um, basically, I, soon after, I was working at the Croydon Advertiser for a period of time, and local papers are amazing because you get literally up to eight jobs a day. And I was all over South London, and I had a very lucky encounter. I got, um, I met somebody who used to work at the Express. And they offered for me, after about a year, to come in and show my portfolio. And these are really local newspaper pictures, you know, go, girl going down slide, plays, fates, Christmas play, you know, the nativities. So I hate to think what they thought my portfolio, but I got Although the point... the parents where, love those, don't The they? parents yeah. love it, because they and made the money for the local yes. paper. So here I go to the Express with my little portfolio under my, my arm and meet the chief editor. And um, I have to say, he ripped me apart. Because <laughs> yes. they... They, he was like, you're not tough enough to be in this business, and completely assassinated me, I never, and I was kind of sat there like, <laughs> shocked. My naivety and my optimism. Um, but he said, you know what I'll do for you? I'll get you work experience with John Downing. Now, John Downing, now, I knew his pictures, but I didn't know the names. I mean, you got to understand, I didn't know the who's who in the business, but I knew imagery. And um, 
I got introduced to John, and John basically has been in every war pretty much since the end of Vietnam. Every major historic moment from, um, and he was imprisoned by Idi Amin, he was, um, when it was Rhodesia, the war yes. there. I mean, every major uh, Tiananmen Square, if you can think of. And basically, I met him, and he pretty much took me under his wing. Um, and that was a really key yes. relationship. Then now how that leads on to Bikers for God was through him I met other photojournalists and he was kind of what you call a news photographer, so do one picture. And then I met a, another photographer called Tom Stoddard, who's what you call a feature photographer, a true photojournalist, who goes out and does these big photo spreads that you'd see in the National Geographic and the Sunday Times. And he turned around to me and he really challenged me because I said, I'm a photographer. He said, well, what story, what are, you, what, what are you saying to the world? What are you communicating? Because um, I, I turned around to him, I said, what story should I do? You know, as if it's the magic story that gets your career going. And he said, you're asking the wrong question. You need to photograph what you're passionate about. And um, basically, around that same time, I met this crazy guy at a conference called Reverend Todd Grew, who stuck out like a sore thumb. It was in Croydon. Long plaited hair, biker dude, really tall. And I thought, you're interesting, I'm gonna go chat to you. Find out that he was a preacher, rode around. Um, he used to go to the really hard biker gang events and festivals and ride outs, and used to do puppets, and used to, to minister to the children through the puppets and then, you know, reach out to the adults and um, so I said hey can I come and photograph your life and he was also riding with a group called Chariots of Light which was through Jerry Savelle's ministry and so I went out um, saved up all the spare money I had and at the time I wasn't making enough money to work as a full-time as a photographer so I was doing data entry at night cleaning I mean it's ridiculous everything I could do went out and photographed him and I thought, great, I've done it, come back. John Downing and Tom looked at my work and went, yeah, it's not good enough. <laughs> and I was like, what? How did you feel? Well, I'm quite a fighter. So I went, right. So you took that as a challenge? Took it as a challenge. They would admit, they thought at that moment I would give up. And, um, and I went, okay then, I'll save up again. <laughs> so you did? So here I did. And I go out again. It's a learning experience. And um, out I go, go on a few tours, got back. They were incredibly generous, helped edit my work. And they're like, right, you need to go out. Very kind. They said, you can use our names, but you've got to go and knock on the doors. And I pretty much knocked on every magazine and publication in London. And um, it was arduous. I mean, they would look yes. at it for two months. There's apparently another biker story out in um, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, uh, Brooklyn bikers or something and they were competing and it was just and I was so like hopeful everyone and the disappointment and and then um it didn't sell so Tom said well look just go to my agency went to the agency they went yeah we'll buy it and of course when they sold it went straight into the Sunday Times magazine which was my dream because that's what I grew up with amazing now you've been doing this for how long oh gosh it's when I give my age away um I started my career at 18 Yes. I'm now 35. So you've been doing it since Ever then. since I left school, literally. And you've been to how many countries? Adding a few in the last few months, probably about uh, around the 45 mark, over 40. And uh, all types of situations? And cultures, and very, cultures yeah. As well. From um, war zones like Sudan, DRC, Congo, to I lived in Bahrain, in Qatar, for a long-term project, I went to Oman, uh, Saudi Arabia, so I've done the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia. I've just been to Burma, which was phenomenal. Yes. Um, the only place, I've gone all over the States, Europe. The only place I haven't been um, and done Eastern Europe is, um, interestingly, South America. That's the only continent I haven't worked on yet. 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 Now, amongst all of this, you, you then get quite burdened uh, about human trafficking. What was it that sparked that off for you? So at the time, I just finished the biker story and I really started getting a, a burden. Um, I, I read somewhere, it started off reading somewhere about a story um, about um, 
just really uh, children being born into sex slavery. And then I was given a magazine by a friend of mine who worked for a charity. And she said, you need to look at this charity magazine. It was called Just Right. Yes. And it was the magazine of the charity Jubilee campaign. And we've got the wonderful founder here, Danny Smith, with us, with us tonight. And uh, basically in that magazine, I read a story of a little baby who was nine months old called Glory, who had been sold to a brothel at nine months. And I was just like, this can't be true. Not today. And... I was like, really, this, 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 and, and they rescued her. So she, they, the charity caught her at moments before she was sold. I was like, really, babies being sold to brothels? I'd never really heard anything like that. And what was interesting in the magazine, which I felt was a sign, is you had the story of this little baby glory. Turn the page, and there was my mentor, John Downing, being interviewed in the magazine. So I pick up the phone, call up John, I go, tell me about this charity. And he goes, oh, they're amazing. I was in Brazil with them, and... They, they work closely with the press. Let's go down and have lunch with the founder. And that's what happened. We all had lunch together. And um, I turned to Danny Smith and said, I, I, I want to go to India. I want, I want to photograph this. I want to tell the story of these children being born into sex slavery, the daughters of, of the prostitutes. And um, that's where it began. And I had never heard. You can understand at that time, trafficking's become a real buzzword yes, now. Yes, it has. But then, no one was talking about trafficking. It wasn't really defined. And it was actually when I was inside the red light district, it's called Kamatipura in Mumbai, um, that I actually met a woman. What triggered it, and I remember the exact moment, this lady suddenly said, why are you, are you from my village? And I was like, of course I'm not from your village. You know, through the translator, are you taking my picture back to my village? And I turned around to, to the aid worker with me and said, why is she asking that? Of course, you know, it's obvious. And she said, he said, well, you know, she was tricked from her village to come here. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And, and, well, she was tricked, and that's trafficking, but they weren't using that word. And no. that's when I first learnt about trafficking. So I went to photograph, you know, the cycle of slavery, which is one aspect, and then learnt that girls, fresh girls, are being brought in from very young ages. I mean, from 10, 11, 12. Um, really, sorry, sorry to use this term, but fresh beat. Yes. Being bought. Yes. Fresh products, because it's purely business. And that's when it, I first learned about it. And it, that trip, I mean, I've worked with a lot of charities and I've been to a lot of countries, but that was a defining moment in my life. It changed my life. Something inside me went off. And um, I would say that's when the activist was born. Before I went, yeah. I was, I wouldn't say just a photographer, but I was a photographer. And I mean, I always blame Danny. I always say it's always Danny's fault. Yes. Because before I was a photographer, and then something burst in me, and a burden. I mean, I was a burden. I was dreaming about the place. I mean, I, I came consumed. And um, it's where, you know, 11 years later. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about your book, um, uh, Taken, but you tell the story about a, a girl called Goody. Just d d tell us her story so that we help us, um, Hazel, to kind of understand what you've been kind of living with, seeing, smelling. Um, but, you know, many of us aren't going to be in those situations. So kind of breathe some life into it for us by telling Goody's story and other people's mm. stories. So I've been going since 2002. So, um, and I last took pictures last year, so that's 11 years. And um, there are many incredible stories. But the one girl who I became incredibly close to, and we have a very unique bond, being, is, a, is this girl called Goody. And I met her back in 2010. So um, I've known her for four, nearly five years. And um, um, I'm, I've met many girls and over the years and interviewed girls. But my first encounter with her, just tell you how I met her, I was in the um, clinic. Um, with the ch of the charity, which is right in the centre of the, the red light district. And suddenly this girl comes falling through the door. And she's, she's at the time, she's 22, very beautiful. And um, this girl was just in floods of tears, very distraught. And I asked the staff member what's wrong. And she's, you know, talking 100 miles an hour. And um, she starts explaining how she's just been beaten up. Um, and she lifts up her 
um, so, uh, sorry and, you know, which is very unusual actually, but she mm. was so distraught, even the stranger in a room, and showed her legs, which were black and blue. She'd had a severe beating. And um, I, slowly after that meeting, I, I get to learn of her story. And she was uh, 11 years old. She's from a very poor village near Kolkata. She's Bengali. She's from a family of 13, very poor. And um, when she was 11, her neighbor, who she's known all her life, came to her mother and said, I can get work for your daughter. And she's very beautiful. I mean, to give you an understanding, this girl mm. looks like she should be in Bollywood. Very stunning girl. Doesn't look like she belongs there. <laughs> and um, I found out, her story's tragic. Her neighbor basically, yes, we get her work. They trusted her, they've known her all her life. Huge betrayal. She arrives in Kamatipura, and to explain Kamatipura, it is a place which is only made up of about five lanes. And um, I've got a picture actually from above, which um, you see these five lanes, it looks like a cage from above, but in that area, very concise area, about 20,000 women and children live and work. It's a lot. It used to be 100,000, but today it's about 20,000. And so when you, you can imagine this little girl, 11 years old, from a rural village, no electricity, nothing, suddenly arrives in this urban city, and they bring her to Kamatipura, and what they did is, the first thing they did is they actually took her to a salon, she doesn't know what's going on, did her hair, because she obviously a village girl, mm. and next thing she knows, and sorry, this is, I'm gonna be very graphic, but this is the reality of it, they drag her into a brothel, a madam and her daughter hold this little 11-year-old girl down by her arms and her legs and allow a man to rape her. Now, they have a term there where they say they rape them to break them. She was so violently raped that she was then put in hospital for three months. Now, it doesn't take much of the imagination yes. to know the violence of that poor little girl. For three months she was in hospital, she was visited by her madam. This little girl didn't even know that the red light district even existed. She doesn't know of anything like this. She doesn't even know what sex is. Mm. And suddenly she thought she was getting a job as a housekeeper. They then take her out of the hospital and then they hold her in a cage for about five or six months. She doesn't see daylight. She's only brought out to eat or to see a customer. And what is horrific is that I found out that it's not that just, this just happened to Goody. This is how they systematically break the girls. And it's so that their will is so broken. And just imagine these are innocent, you know, I say, think of your daughters, if you're not a mother or a father, think of nephews, nieces. An 11-year-old child who is much more innocent than children here in this country. To imagine what that little girl was going through. And then eventually what they do to gain control of them, they slowly start letting them out bit by bit. And so she was 11. Then when she was about 15, 16, they start letting her, you know, four or five years later on the street. Now, when you actually go to Kamatipura, you see girls lining the street and they're very young. You know, I see 15, 16 year olds on the street, but actually they're, they're the old timers. Mm. It's the girls who are held in the cages inside these huge brothel houses who are babies. Some of them haven't even hit puberty. Uh, you, you went into these brothels and you, I've seen this found, you found the cages. So yeah, I, so here I've heard, so I repetitively heard the girls tell me the story of these cages. And uh, you know, to, to understand my role to go into the red light district was, I want to show the reality of this place. You know, people think red light districts are places of pleasure. They're places of pain. And also, they're, they're, they're not nice places. And I hate to say this, I've been in a lot of red light districts around the world. 
and spend a lot of time in a lot of brothels, from high-end brothels to what I call slum brothels. None of them are pleasant places. But Kamati Pura, especially this red light district, is, I call it the armpit of India. You know, it really, it really is hell on earth. And to describe it, if you want me to give you, it smells, there is raw sewage, vomit on the streets, there's rats everywhere. There's cockroaches everywhere. Um, it's, it's a dark place. You see the girls lining the street, but inside these brothels, when you go in these big buildings, there's layer after layer, it's like a rabbit warren. And you, I mean, it's up, down, through, but it is pitch black inside. You can't, I had to be navigated through. And but, how, but how did you get in? So, um, I got in um, because of Jubilee Campaign has been working there since um, 96. And they work with an Indian partner on the ground called Bombay Team Challenge. Yep. And they've been working there since 1990. And they have an incredible relationship. They've been rescuing the girls, rescuing, the, you know, even building relationship with the madams. So it wasn't because of me, purely because they have so much trust in the area. They've, they've transformed so many lives and made such an impact and been the voice for the voiceless and the poor there that they had aid workers. And I went, by the way, undercover as an aid worker. I didn't go as a photojournalist. The first times when I arrived, because I don't go in one hit, I go bit by bit over the years. They think I'm working, well, I am, I'm working with the charity. Mm. So they see me as an aid worker. I sit and spend time and talk. But what was happening is my guy, the head of the charity, Devaraj, started to open up the, the, the secrets and then their staff members. And one of their staff members was a street boy from a family that had been generations in the red light district. His mother was a temple prostitute in the area, was a madam, had their own brothels in the family, and his brother was part of the gangs. He was on the edge of the gangs. The boys you see, the boys of the red light district, they become pimps yes. and the gangsters. So everyone's involved. So this young man and Devaraj started to open up the secrets of the area and they know it. They grew, he, this guy grew up there. So he, uh, what started to happen, this is how I did it. I started to interview the girls. They would tell me their stories, the cages, the, they started to tell me about trapdoors, the, the police, the, what happens is that the police are very corrupt there. If the police aren't paid their bribe, if, they, if the police have paid the bribe, they get a, the brothels get a, a warning and they have these secret trapdoors and hidden areas, hidden walls where they hide the minor girls. But if they pay their, you know, if they don't pay their bribe, they don't get the warning. So these girls started to tell me about these trapdoors and awful things, the torture, just the, the, the secret of this place. And I was like, well, I've, I've got to get photographic evidence of this. I've got to, I've got to show the reality. Um, so I started to get obsessed. I need to get a picture of these cages. So literally, this aid worker... So you went worker, in with your camera? Yeah, I mean, he, what did he did... Where did you hide your camera? He mapped it out for me, and then each day we'd go, well, let's target this today. It was bit by bit gathering evidence. So what I would do is I would wear a sal kameez top, which is the tunic top, and the trousers. Um, I have a scarf, so I always have a scarf with it to cover my head, and I would cover my camera over his shoulder. I had a little backpack, I had my camera out. And I would literally, it started off with, they would hide me out in the back of brothels for hours. I've spent hours, weeks in the back of these brothels and on the roofs. We, and the red light district would come alive at night. So this is shooting, you know, two, till two, three in the morning. So I'd hide for hours in, on the roofs, watching, observing, waiting, trying to hide. I mean, to give you an idea, there's even watchers on the roofs. Everyone's watched. The girls describe it as an open prison. Yes. And then also they would sneak me just before the sun would set, looking like I'm doing aid work. They would sneak me into the brothels where they had relationships, connections. We would map it out. And I literally would hide out, stake out, like I'm a police officer get, gathering intelligence. And I would sit there hiding in the darkness. Um, we had other techniques. Um, to get the cage in particular, now this was a, this was, this took a long time. Yes. And if I'm honest, I was talking about it 
I talked about it for years. We're not talking months. We're talking no. well, you years. spent eight months researching this over a period well, of 12 no, years. No, no, not eight months researching. I mean, I've been researching yeah. this for the whole 11 years, but eight Eleven, months actually living. Living there. Six to eight, I mean, it's, you understand, you go in for a bit, it, it would get hostile, I'd be threatened, we'd have to pull out. Because the priority in all of this, you have to have, just to say, the girls come first, the safety of the girls and the safety of the aid workers. So I would, I basically completely submitted to whatever they told me to do. Sure. So if they said, if they said run, I ran. I mean, we, so I spent a long time and over that time I started to learn who were the top gangsters, who were the, you know, I literally learned the whole community in depth, got to know the girls, they became my friends. And one day, the quiet time in the red light district is the morning. And one morning, my in journalistic terms, we, we call them fixers. My fixer, who's the aid worker, suddenly said, come. And he didn't really explain that day. So I wasn't really, you know, I'd been obsessing about trying to find these cages. And I, what I wanted to do is actually get this, I knew if I got a photograph of a little girl in a cage, the world would wake up, the world would care. Because I have to say, in the, uh, the 11 years of going to this place, I would come back and be like, nobody cares, the frustration. So I was like, I've got to get this image. So that day, he said, um, come. And he told me, don't talk. Put your scarf over your camera. I think I had one in my backpack. He told me not to look at eye contact. He said, just follow him. And I was used to that. I learned to trust him. And he took me in a brothel house I hadn't been in before. We had one lane we were, we were mainly working on, which is the lane he grew up in. We went slightly to a different brothel. And he started leaning into this big brothel house. And you've got to understand there's hundreds of brothels in, the, in one building. And we just went, it's like you enter the darkness. And he started to, I was holding one hand, you touch the walls, and the walls are literally slimy with condensation and sweat. And I've never, and I can't describe, but there's a smell which you, I've only smelt in these places. And it's, it's a smell of death, really, and of just, it, it really, so you, the walls are crawling, there's rats everywhere, rats became my friends. Um, I would name them to get over the size. Um, and he led me up, down, I mean, I had no idea how to get out. Through the darkness, one hand holding his hand, me trying to get through, fumbling through. And then we got to one corridor, which is tiny, about this wide. So I'm sliding down, and as I'm going by, I'm seeing cage doors. So not only are there cage boxes in these places, they're cages within cages. This, this place has layer after layer. So we went through the first cage, and then we're we, we've only penetrated one layer. We're going through, and I'm seeing these cage doors. I'm seeing the shadows, haunting faces of some of the women, seeing the gangsters, the pimps as we go by, trying not to give eye contact, just pushing through, seeing people asleep inside behind these doors. And then we get to end of one corridor, and there's one light bulb. And we, I see one cage door at the end, and he's like beckoning me because I can't talk. And he knocks and says something in Hindi. And this woman, this man comes to the door with a huge bolt of chains like a prison officer, opens the door, I'm ushered in, and I sit in what you call the reception area. Now, reception areas, now, what I find amazing is this is where they bring the customers. <laughs> and the reception area is where they bring the girls down from the cages. So they sit me in the reception area. Next thing I know, there's another little small room round, and obviously I'm just kind of nodding, and it's a really old madam. And next thing I know, my fixer beckons me to the other room, pulls out a ladder, opens a trap door above, which I hadn't seen, puts the ladder on and set points up and pushes me up. And it isn't until that moment where my head, and all this is a very contained spaces, and also, by the way, it's like 40 degrees, 45 in heat, it's intense in there. I don't know how these little girls survive. Mm. You can't breathe, it's like having a blanket on your face. I push my head up and right in front of me, I realize 
I was looking at what I've been wanting to photograph for so long. And there it was. I was halfway, my body halfway up, and there was a box cage. Huge padlock on it. I can't ask any questions. There wasn't only one box cage. There was about three or four. Now, this was like in the eaves. The cage was no higher than this chair. I couldn't even stand up. I could hardly get on my knees. And very hurriedly, I'm pulling out my cameras. It's dark in there as well. Because I knew that I had to work quickly because I knew that this moment may never come again. But this is the worst bit. I'm up in this hole. And then I realize there's a padlock and there's bras thrown over the top of this box. And I can honestly say to this day, I still don't know if a girl was behind that door. Mm. I couldn't talk because I remember putting my camera over. There was a little gap at the top. I had this little flip camera, this tiny little film camera, trying to put it in to see later if I could see any footage. It was pitch black. I, couldn't, I didn't put my face, but the camera. I quickly worked, a bit in shock, and this desperation comes over you because I'm like, I've got to get it. I can't mess this up. And then um, my fixer said, you've got to come down quick. And we had to get out of that building quickly. Um, and that was, I don't even know how long I was up there. It felt like an eternity in one moment and not long enough. I was desperate. I remember getting back to my room that night. And what you have to do is you have to download your material every day because the traffickers are watching me. I could get followed. We were watched constantly. I had to hide my material. Yeah. I remember looking at that footage, desperately putting up the lightness in the screen to see if I could see a girl. Mm. But to this day, I still don't know. Um, but I got the evidence. And this box cage is what the girls told me about. And it's real. You know, you think it's a horror story. You don't want it to be real. But it was a reality. And it was hidden up a trapdoor, just as the girls had described to me. <sighs> Sorry. It's no, we, we, we need to hear it, Hazel. And um, um, you're a very courageous woman. The, the history of some of these brothels um, is shocking because the British started many of these brothels. Tell us about that. So during the British Raj um, period and the military being in India, um, they created comfort zones for the soldiers. And, um, and they actually started systematically procuring young girls. So they were actually trafficking even back then yes. in the 1800s. And uh, with Danny did a lot of research with this as well in depth for the book. But what happened was I, when I was in Kamati Pura, I started seeing buildings with like, you know, really old dates, 1911, 1920, during the British Raj era, these very old buildings. And in these buildings, some of the buildings, they were telling me this is over 100 years old. They were saying, this bed here was my, not my grandmother's, my great-grandmother's. I mean, these families have been stuck in this cycle of slavery. And then they were like, this was the British. This is your history. And I'm like, really? So we started to dig deeper. I, I went into the library there to try and get photographic evidence to learn about the area. And then we learned, finding that um, young girls were being procured when they were actually um, recruiting in the UK for officers to go to India, they were telling about these exotic girls that you can have. So even using it as a tool. And what they were doing is they were supplying girls. Every, wherever there was a military base, a component, they would have girls at the back. And Kamati Pura actually was a trades area. The Kamatis were tradespeople. And it started no longer to be a trades area, but become a comfort zone. So some brothels were there, but there were some brothel houses who were purely for the military. So when the guys would come off the ships, they would be brought to these particular, the, the military house. 
Now, what was incredible and the history we found, and something that really had an impact on me, which I didn't find out till last year, was a link to the history. So here we're learning that these girls are being procured, found evidence, found that it was even discussed in Parliament. And the reason being is what was an amazing friend of mine, who's an academic actually, researching trafficking, spent time in India, said, Hazel, you've got to read this book, handed it to me, called The Queen's Daughters of India. And I was reading this book actually on a flight. I live on planes. Mm. And what's incredible is I was reading this book written in 1892. Now, these two women were two missionaries that travelled from America to come to, to see, to research what was happening with these young girls, these prostitutes being used for the military, in the military bases. She, they came via the UK, met with amazing acclaimed and rejoiced feminist now, Josephine Butler, who encouraged them mm. as well. So all connected, did this research. And I was reading their research. And what they did was they basically wrote down the case studies, illustrated the stories. I sat on this flight reading these stories and I started weeping because the stories were virtually exact to the stories that I was hearing today. And it's 120 years later. And there was one line that I knew that I was called for a time such as this mm. to do this project. Now, remember, I spent 11 years, and it's these signposts that would come to me, say, you're on the right path. When I last was in the red light district, now I haven't gone back, I went back um, March, April last year. And I knew I pushed every limit. I was desperate to get every final bit of footage I could to go in this book. And I went to say goodbye to Goody. And you've got to realise, over the time I've known her, every time I go back, I don't know if I'm going to see her there again. I don't know if she's going to be alive. I'm not going to get emotional, but I, mm. I don't know. And um, I love this girl very much. She, to explain her, she showed the child in her with me. She would weep with me. But I also saw the fighter. And she was trapped. She's now trapped in debt slavery. But we tried to get her to go to the rescue home, have a rescue home many times. But she's trapped in there. It's, com it's very complex getting these girls that have been long term in slavery. And I was begging her. She was, I was hugging her and she was weeping in my arms. I mean, soaked me in her tears. And I was begging her, Goody, please. You've got to leave. Please go to the home. Trust them. You've got to understand. You're thinking, well, just get her out. But you can't force these girls. Her, but her, tr her trust has been betrayed by everybody. Why is she going to trust? And when we tried to get to her home, by the way, she, when we tried to take her to the building, she was so, in the building, she was so panicked, she ran. Because these girls were so traumatised. And that was raped. a safe house. That was a safe house. We even took her there to try and... Yep. But she wasn't ready. You can't force them. She's so scared. Why believe us? So I sat with her and she was weeping. And I was like, you know, I love you. I, she's like, please don't go. And I'm begging her, please go to the home. And um, I said, just trust, Goody. And she said to me one line, and that's why the book is called Taken. And she said to me, I said, please go. And she turned around to me through the translator, by the way. She said, but my life was taken when they brought me here. And she's dead, you know, I'm dead anyway. And she wept, and I never forget the last moment. I felt her heartbeat on my chest. I could feel her, and I was like, please, God, you know, protect this girl. And I, when I was reading, so I'm back in this aeroplane, I'm reading this book, reading these stories, and I'm like, how can this not change in 120 years? These women even went to Parliament, even took their evidence to Parliament. You know, and suddenly I read one last line, and I'm, I can't quote this exactly, but they said, um, we have left with their eyes haunting us, the memory of their faces, their eyes haunting us, and the memory of their heartbeats against our chest. And um, I was like, wow, that was my last moment. Sorry to get so emotional. And... Um,
And here I am, 120 years later, reading this book. And I got back, and I was so like, wow, right. I was like, I think I phoned Danny and said, we've got to call the Queen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I literally did. Oh. I think I called him, we've got to call the Queen. This is our history. I was so enraged. This is our history. This is the heritage. But what's amazing is I got to take this book, Taken, and it's, I think, one of the first e-books, and there was an, we did an app, and I stood in Parliament among the peers, among parliamentarians, and I was Bonitation. very, thank you, very <laughs> kindly invited by Lord Alton and Fiona Bruce, who are amazing, again, amazing warriors in, in the cause of slavery and involved in the um, uh, modern-day slavery bill and incredible. And I stood there, and to stand in Parliament, the privilege and the honour, and say it's been 120 years, why am I still writing and photographing the same stories? You know? This should not be repeating. This is a disgrace, not in this modern age. Yeah, you've had time to um, research more on human trafficking. You've been to many other countries. You've been to South Africa, you've been to Sweden, you've been to America, all over Europe. Okay, help us to understand uh, what is happening regarding human tra trafficking globally, including England. Okay. So I haven't, I have researched UK, I'm not an expert on the UK, but there are trends, we call them, patterns, yes. very systematic patterns. So what's been amazing is my job of going to all these different countries. I've, I think I've, I've recently been to the US, actually. Uh, literally three weeks or so ago, I've just got back. So I um, was shocked what was there. Um, it's not a third world problem. This is a global problem in every single country, I believe. We are selling and buying human beings, children and women. And it's right under our noses. So the, the certain things that, the patterns that break my heart in first world and third world cultures is girls are tricked, enticed. In a third world country where it's poor, it's easy. You offer them a job, you offer them an opportunity. In a first world country, you groom them over the internet. A madam said something to me. I, I, did, um, I was raiding brothels with the Vice Squad around the World Cup. You know, trafficking thrives around mini military bases, around sporting events. And I was at the World Cup, and I got the opportunity to an interview a madam. It's good to hear the other side of the story. And I said, how do you find your girls? She said, oh, that's easy. I keep close to the local community, and I find out who's failed their matric, which is like their GCSEs, and I go and find them. They've got no future, and I tell them, you can, um, I can give you work, you can earn good money, and they entice them in, they groom them in. They target the vulnerable. It's a business, they go for the easy pickings. So they're sick, the shocking, the way they do it is very, I'm seeing trends throughout the countries. In Sweden, um, Last year, I interviewed a girl that was 11. Her parents were divorcing from a good middle-class family, from a lovely village in quaint, beautiful Sweden. And this guy befriended her on a chat room, said, I'll be your boyfriend, we'll get married. 11. Then asked her, you know, for us to get married, I need you to do some, thing for, some things for my friends. Could you just go and have dinner? She goes, have dinner. And you know how I told you how goody they rate yes. them to break them? He goes, do you want to come and watch a movie in my room? She's 11. Takes her up to the room. Before she gets through the door, she's pushed to the ground and raped. She's so ashamed she felt she brained her boyfriend, left literally bleeding on the floor, gets home. The boyfriend said, you didn't do good enough. Then for the next five years, systematically sold her, even gave her a driver, still going to school, middle-class family, she was going to the same hotels being taken around Sweden. Don't you wonder why those hotel staff didn't question why that 11-year-old was seen with 40, 50-year-old men? It's right under our noses. And that is where it's scary. South Africa, this madam that I told you about, she ran a high-end brothel in Table View, which is like probably smaller than Chorley Wood. There were 49 brothels known to the vice squad. 
I photographed the outside of those brothels by thriving churches, by schools, by playgrounds. It is right under our noses. And so that is what's heartbreaking when you see the tricks haven't changed, and clearly not for 120 years. What's the estimated number of people um, that might be human trafficked at the moment? Um, the latest uh, Kevin Bell's is, uh, you know, the slavery index was saying it's near to 30 million, so it's about 29.9. Now, over half of those are in India. Um, now, that obviously, human trafficking includes sex slavery, bond, bondage labour, you know, labour trafficking. Um, it's the whole spectrum. And I have to say, you know, I've just happened to focus a lot on, on sex trafficking. But um, labour is a major issue, human trafficking. You know, this is the thing, human trafficking is booming. It's a billion pound industry. Because uh, drugs you sell once, but a girl you sell again and again and again. And, you know, to the point in the US that I just learnt, is they're putting barcodes on these girls. The pimps, they own them. They're putting the pimps' names tattooed and tattooing barcodes. They are a product, it's a flesh trade, and they make serious money. And it's about life and death. They will kill you because that investment of that girl that they've trafficked could be worth 50,000, 100,000, depending on which country. They, you know, some girls are work to be with 20, 30 men a day. OK, so take America, Hazel. Um, what, why isn't the government rescuing them? I mean, the government will send their army to another country across the world to release people who are in captivity. Why aren't they releasing these vulnerable okay, so girls? Firstly, it's a criminal activity. So we don't really know, you know, you have to use intelligence. They're hidden. The girls are hidden. It's hidden. There's, uh, you know, you, we need to start going through our supply chains. We need to start questioning. I, there's two main things which I think aren't being focused on. We focus a lot on who are the traffickers and where the girls have been taken from. What I've noticed is everyone talks about, you know, cross-border trafficking. But in my work, especially looking at Sweden, USA, South Africa, even Cambodia, the girls have been domestically trafficked, which means within the country. So these are, you know, Swedish girls being sold by Swedish men and gangs. You know, a lot of it is gang controlled. Um, backhanders going to police, there's a lot of corruption, politicians, especially in India, and it must, it's everywhere, it's corruption. So, uh, these girls, you know, they're seen, I think, for years as they're just prostitutes. But when you actually, they choose to be there, but actually they've been yes. enticed in. Do you know the average age that a girl enters into prostitution in the USA is 13 years old? Now, that's the average. It's, it's going to be, it's about the same in the UK. And, um, as I said, I'm not the expert on the no, stats, but... but what, what are, are, aren't the governments doing something? There is. I mean, <laughs> there's all the, the tier levels. You've got the tit report. There is people... It's very much everyone's focusing on trafficking, but it is a complex issue. Personally, I think we should start focusing on demand. The girls have been taken to feed a market. Now, I believe... That, and by the way, it's not just girls that have been trafficked yes. into, into sex trafficking, it's all labour is boys too. Boys too yeah. Many boys. Um, you know, I, I haven't cracked that one yet, but many boys. And actually, when I was, I was in San Francisco, I, I met a number of people from, from the gay community, and they were saying there's a lot of young boys that have been enticed in and said that area really needs to be looked at. And what's. Um, I think. I believe that there, there's a myth. I think many men, and um, I've never seen a woman, so this isn't me targeting on men, but I've never seen a woman to go and use the girls, have sex with the girls. Obviously, I've, a lot of women are involved, OK? It, this is not about many of the madams, many of the traffickers are women. So this is not hitting out the, uh, uh, at men. But I believe if a man... A lot of the men believe that the girls want to be there, they're choosing to do it, that they're kind of doing them a favour, they're giving them work. But I believe if men truly knew why these girls are there, that I don't think... I think they would start questioning. And we need to start questioning, what is it in our society that it's OK to go and allow this? You know, US, 
nine in the morning, I'm in San Jose, Silicon Valley, where the big money is, the big blue chip companies, the brains for the future of our technology. Now, in India, there's a quiet time, but for the first time, I saw a buzzing red light strip track at 9 a.m. in the morning. Pimps, it was like out of a movie. Pimp cars, these guys pushing around. It was literally a Tarantino movie. Tarantino movie. Yes. Shocking. Out there, open, police walking around. I saw a police go, car go by. And all those girls, they were, they were local. African-American girls. These were not... These were local girls. So you're, you, you're, you're an investigative journalist. You're trying to tell the story. Uh, many of your stories um, have circulated in uh, global magazines and newspapers. Uh, is the story being heard? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been involved I, I've, I've been very privileged as a journalist. I'm, I'm, working, I'm now working, starting off at the Croydon Advertiser, I'm now working for some amazing publications. Like I'm, a, New York I'm a contract Times. in the New York Times. I've recently become a uh, contributor for The Guardian. I'm starting to write for them, which I find very amusing because I'm actually quite severely dyslexic. Yes. Um, but I have, you know, I'm witnessing these things and that's had to, I've had to really overcome that because my... My photography has grown, but I, I've, I have to say, my insecurity as a writer is on another scale. I'm terrified. And all through my career, I've worked with polit you know, amazing writers, and it just terrifies me. And it's always like giving birth when I have to write. Um, but photography comes natural, but I have to do it, and I know the importance of it. But, yeah, I, uh, this work um, has been distributed. It's, it's you know, been in The Guardian, it's been in Stern magazine, it's been in different countries. But the, the reason I created the book is while I've been there, I actually gathered multimedia. It's not just still pictures. I gathered sounds, I gathered video. Um, so the reason I created it as an e-book was because it, I had so many facets that would take... I wanted to take the viewer right in there that you feel like you're there, that you can hear the sounds. That I, I wish it had smell of, smell of yes. vision. But, or maybe not, you don't want to... Um, I mean, I'll tell you one... I mean, I, I didn't get away. I, I'll tell you how filthy the... There is literally raw sewage everywhere. I mean, I, I didn't come away... I, I caught typhoid on one of my years that I was there. I mean, this place, everyone gets malaria. The sickness is on another level there. Um, I won't be spreading typhoid through the book. Don't worry. But, um, but I, I did this book because I wanted... And it's a touchscreen experience that you feel like you're there, you're hearing it, you're feeling it. Because let's be honest, we're a bit all bombarded, aren't we? People are tired, there's always bad news. And it's really hard as a journalist, I want to be a voice for the voiceless, but to get that voice heard among all these voices, we're bombarded with imagery every day and advertising and there's messages everywhere. And to stand out is very difficult. So that's why I did the book, because... It's multi-layered. You've got the stills, there's pictures and pictures. It's the writing. You can listen to me telling and talking about the story. And it, it was, it's to penetrate uh, deeper. That I, you know, the, the reason I went and spent hours in those brothels, weeks, and it, I'm telling you, I, I didn't, don't think it's that courageous. I was terrified. I was threatened. Um, I was dragged down a street by one of the gangsters nearly. Goody rescued me. It's a very scary place. The last time I went back, I knew I was pushing it. You know, I don't... I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I made a decision. I was like, I'm not scared of death anymore. And I felt very challenged in my spirituality and in my faith that if I'm not scared of death anymore, then I should be able to face it. And if I really should trust that I'm protected, really trust, I can go and open, like Daniel, open the lion's mouth and stick my head in. And that's what it felt like. But sometimes I saw the teeth and it was pretty scary. Yeah. And you've got to understand, I'm hiding in the back of these darkness. And they can just drag me and I'll be gone. They won't find me. And I'll never forget the last time I was there. Oh, my gosh. I had my big lens. I was hiding. Would you believe there's factories making clothes inside the red light districts mm. as well? And I was hiding in one of the factories. And I remember on a pile of handbags or something hidden at the edge of a window, and I had to put my long lens, and there was, a, there was a pimp with this woman. He suddenly spotted at me, and I remember I've got the big lens, and pointed, 
and two guys came running into the building and it looked like they were coming at me. And I was like, we have got to go. I'm with my fixer and we jump into the darkness and start going down the corridor. They ran past us. I mean, moments. To go in the buildings, how did I get on the roofs? We would walk around and my fixer would say, we've got to get into that building. I think there's a trap door there or I believe there's girls there and let's go up there. And it's layers and there's, there's guards on every door. I mean, this place is run, the police are corrupt. They're, the police in Kamati Pura are taking money, okay? They, they fight to get in that area because they make good money. So they do nothing. They, I, I, I saw them getting their bribes every day. And I would sit, I know I would sit, we would walk around and suddenly my fixer would go, let's run in that building. When he said run, and I would always say under my breath, let, you know, I see them like it's war zone, it's the enemy's camp. I felt like I was going to war, like my cameras are guns. That's how I feel, I really feel like I'm in a war zone. And I'm like, I want there to be confusion in that enemy's camp. And I would go literally past two guys, guys standing by the door and they're thinking, why is that white girl running yeah. in the building? We would run up the building, I'd photograph everything I could going up in the darkness. They're, we'd run up, run down, and they'd still be standing there a bit, ooh, what's happened? And we would just run off. And we'd be on a roof. I would camp on the roof, and then suddenly, there, it's so, you, I wouldn't see certain things. And suddenly my fixer would go, we have to go now. I mean, it was split seconds. Hazel Thompson. I think it's good you didn't go to university. <laughs> it really wasn't the right route for you. It is for <laughs> many people. Um, great you became a photojournalist, but it's great that you have a, a passion and a compassion and that you are an activist. And um, we give thanks and thank you for what you're doing and uh, the inspiration uh, that you've imparted to us, Hazel Thompson.